if you, if you can start recording. Uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, CEO and president, Nick Pinizzato. Uh Nick's coming to us from not in Pennsylvania, although he hails from Pennsylvania. He's out hunting somewhere else. And uh, Nick, what's going on at the NDA these days? What, what, what can you tell the audience about what's, what's new and happening? Well, I was hoping you were going to talk about hunting. Oh. But uh, you said earlier we weren't in a tree anywhere, and that's not true. I was in a tree just about an hour ago, actually. Um, but yeah, I am out on location. I apologize for the uh, video quality. It's not what it typically would be, but good to see everybody here. And I think we ought to, as I, as I look at the title of the show, I think we ought to title it uh, Hitting the Panic Button. What can I do to save my season? And then we do it in mid-November because people are looking at the calendar and it's November 10th, and I see a lot of people say they haven't filled a buck tag, um, you're wondering what can I do to make it happen here in the last, uh, as, the, as we get through the peak part of the rut. So hopefully some of the information here that Kit gives you tonight will help you do that. So with that, uh, what's going on at the NDA? Well, there's a heck of a lot going on at the NDA. Uh, just a few things I want to go through and then we'll jump to Kip. Uh, our latest CWD roundup is live on our website. So you want to check that out. I'm sure no one really wants to talk about chronic wasting disease right now, uh, but it's you know, something we have to continue to talk about. I want to remind everybody, Matt mentioned uh, our podcast, the Coffee and Deer podcast, which is uh, hosted by myself and my good buddy, uh, Mike Groman, the doctor, and the Deer Season 365, which is hosted by uh, our man, Brian Grossman. Uh, very different, uh, uh, not very different, but slightly different podcast formats. Uh, check those out. Subscribe to both of them, if you will. Um, we're getting getting pretty good reviews on them, so check them out if you haven't already. Uh, our latest sweepstakes going on right now, you may have seen it, uh, for two mission crossbows. That's going to be open through Tuesday, November 16th at midnight. So if you're interested in jumping in on that, don't wait, because uh, time's going to run out quickly on you. Just go to deerassociation.com for more information on that. Uh, we have two more sweepstakes coming up yet for 2021 as we head toward the end of the year here. So follow our website for announcements. Or better yet, if you're not already getting our NDA newsletter, this comes out every Thursday. Uh, it's very popular. We've got a lot of subscribers on that thing. But if you're not subscribed, please do that and you'll get notification of these sweepstakes as, long, uh, as well as good articles. Uh, we do the Age This segment in there all the time, our policy updates. It's a lot of great information. And I personally look forward to getting that every Thursday morning. So uh, check that out. Uh, we received the $1,000 promotional grant from our friend, Melissa Bachman. Uh, she's the host of Winchester Deadly Passion. I'm sure many of you know Melissa. She's also been on our board of directors and is an advisory committee member now. Uh, anyway, it's uh, for the Mountain Dew Outdoor Grants. And she the grant was for our Field to Fork program. And we're still eligible for a $5,000 grant. So uh, if you're able to nominate us, we'd appreciate that. I think anybody can nominate. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, our friends at Mountain Dew. Um, speaking of Field to Fork and speaking of being on location, uh, Field to Forks are in full swing. We hope you've seen the updates that we've had on our social media. Hank and Matt are currently in New York hosting a program with the Nature Conservancy, uh, Hunters of Color and the New York Department of Environmental Conservation uh, hosting 10 new uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color hunters who are residents in New York. So we're excited about that one. We're also documenting the program with support from a National Shooting Sports Foundation Hunting Heritage Grant. So I said a lot there. There's a lot going on, uh, but this is a very exciting field of work event, one of many that we've done this year. Um, and so, uh, again, look for more information on our social media as that comes out there. Uh, don't forget the men. Speaking of field of fork, don't forget the men are a new hunter this year. Let's help. Uh, let us help with our free and paid educational resources. We're utilizing our online hunter education and our deer hunting 101 online hunting courses for all field to fork hunters. So that's something to check out, and it'll work for your mentees as well. Reach out to Hank. That's Hank Forster. Hank at DeerAssociation.com for a flyer on all those resources. Again, it's out there. Please take advantage of it. Uh, some other things. I mentioned CWD earlier. We worked with our friends at OnX to develop a new CWD layer on their app. It shows where the CWD actually is, the boundaries of the disease management zones, not just the counties like it used to. And also you'll be able to find out where you're hunting, what the sampling rules and regulations are and more. Uh, I was recently hunting in Kentucky and it was handy to know what I could do with a deer if I wanted to bring it back from Kentucky to Pennsylvania, for example. Uh, so it's very helpful. Check that out. 
Uh, again, this is this is new news. We were we were hopeful this would happen, and it turns out that it did. We're going to host the Southeast Deer Study Group meeting again next year. We hosted it last year, went really well. We're going to do that again this year, and it's also this should be exciting to you if if you're interested and you're one of the deer nerds like us. It's virtual again. And so anybody is welcome to attend this. And that's typically not the case. We said that last year, this is usually a in-person event, which is really limited more to uh, academics and researchers and people that work in the deer space. Um, but this is some, this is virtual and you can attend. So save the date, it's February 21st through the 23rd. And you can see what all the latest new deer research is at that time. Uh, and then finally, we'd like to thank all of you who have already supported NDA, the NDA fund this year. Uh, the fund touches all aspects of NDA's work and mission, and it's a great way to show your support. If you haven't donated yet this year, uh, you can join the hundreds that already have by visiting deerassociation.com slash NDA fund. So as you're thinking about your year end giving, the year's coming to a close, please keep us in mind. Uh, but I'm excited to say that we have had really uh, just an outstanding year this year. And a lot of that has to do with your support and your help, everything from the branch level to those of you who took the time to even uh, write us a check beyond your membership, or even if you just got a membership for the first time. And so that's very exciting, uh, considering where we were a couple of years ago heading into the pandemic. Uh, I can sit here and very happily tell you uh, that your National Deer Association is in a very good and healthy place right now. And that's something that we're all proud of. So with that, off with the boring stuff. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Kip. Everyone gets your notebooks ready. See if he can help you fill that tag here as we head down the stretch of the rut. So Kip, it's all yours, buddy. Sounds good, Nick. So uh, thank you very much. So uh, lots of exciting things going on uh, at the organization for sure. And uh, Matt, anything else uh, that you need before uh, I can take over? No, uh, that was an exciting update. There is a lot going on. We're excited to be out there this weekend. And, uh, it's, you know, we all live for this time of year, both personally and professionally. And, and, and as crazy and busy as it is, uh, a lot of great things are going on. It's, it's glad to be able to share it with you guys here. So Kip's about to, to start his, uh, the feature presentation. I'll introduce the topic and a little bit about him. If you don't know anything about Kip, he's our chief conservation officer, as I mentioned earlier. Um, he's a certified wildlife biologist. Um, he's kind of the face and uh, the voice of the National Deer Association. We have him on a lot of different platforms, on video, um, and he does a great job with all of the things in our conservation department and overseeing uh, what we do. Um, he's also in Pennsylvania. He's worked as a uh, state level agency biologist in New Hampshire and in Florida. And, uh, and I've, I've met, known Kip for over 15 years. And what you may not know about Kip is he's, he's also a very talented taxidermist too, which is, which is a, a nice little tidbit of information. But Kip is gonna talk tonight about what we all do want to hear in the middle of November is a topic about how deer communicate and how we can capitalize on that. And so the title is Rubs and Scrapes, the 411 on deer communication. So Kip, I'm going to hand the baton over to you. Please entertain and educate us and we'll come back for Q&A at the end. Floor is yours. All right, my pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, as I start this, actually, Matt, I'm going to turn my video off. Uh, as you know, I live in a great place, very rural, good hunting, great place to raise kids, not always the best internet service. So uh, I'm gonna save some bandwidth by, uh, by turning my video off to make sure that this doesn't lag for folks. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with this. And uh, I will say this, I'm, I'm excited to give this tonight. I remember uh, almost a year ago now when Matt and I were laying out all the different uh, webinars for the whole year and picking, and we wanted almost 12 months in advance. Um, I specifically picked November with this talk. I wanted to give this talk. I wanted to give it now just because this is the best time of the year to be in the woods. It is so exciting what's going on. So uh, anyway, um, I enjoy uh, presenting to, to about deer, about habitat, but uh, I really, really like this topic, Matt, and I'm excited for tonight. So uh, with that, uh, rubs and scrapes, uh, the 411 and how deer communicate. And with this, we're going to talk about, you know, deer communicated in several different ways. I'm going to touch on many very briefly, but then we are going to focus on the rubs and scrapes part once we get into this. So, uh, you know, deer are far more so than most people realize. 
people know they obviously have to communicate, but they communicate in several different ways and on very different levels. So uh, let's talk about some of those and just to let folks know, hey, this is really what's going on in the woods out there. And all of this is really designed to just teach you a little more about deer, how they interact, to allow you to get a little bit closer to them, but also then just to enjoy more of what's going on. You know, the more we can understand about interactions that we see is makes us have a better understanding and appreciation for this creature. Better understanding of how they actually communicate what they need to do can help us get a little bit closer, whether that's with a camera or a bow or a rifle or whatever the case may be. So uh, so deer are very social. And while Matt and I have our cell phones with us uh, everywhere we go, uh, deer obviously don't have a cell phone, but they can communicate every bit as easily with how they do it as we do with a cell phone. And uh, yeah, it's not to their ear at all the times, but think about this. Deer live in a whole variety of different cover types from just about the Arctic down to, you know, Central America, forested areas, not forested areas, open areas, plains, semi-forested, agricultural areas, all kinds of different cover types and environments. And they are able to do a great job communicating very easily. And always. So let's take a look at some of the ways that they can do this without all this modern technology. And, and let's start with sight. Deer communicate with sight. You know, I'm, I'm gonna show you a picture of a white tail here. Obviously this is a white tail deer and a lot of people think about white tails as, oh yeah, they call it that because the underside of the tail is white. But there's actually a lot more to it than that. From a standpoint, deer see the world very similarly to the way a human does who is red green colorblind. Meaning that fluorescent orange or that hunter orange hat or jacket you're wearing, deer don't see that as orange. They see that as green. So uh, you're not giving anything up to deer by wearing that. However, their eyes are a little different and they see really, really good into the blue spectrum, which means they see yellow very well and they see blues really, really well. So don't wear your blue jeans hunting, don't wear anything yellow hunting, but understand that because they see so good into the blues, and this is especially true in low light situations, the color white really, really stands out to them. And in fact, with deer, it's not just the underside of their tail that's white. You can see here the whole rump is white, the whole underside of the deer is. And this is designed specifically for them to be able to follow one another in these low light situations, especially when they're avoiding predators. So take a look, we see here, yeah, there's a lot of white. This deer behind clearly can see the deer ahead, where it's going and the way their eyes are built, it essentially is a big beacon, a bright white light in front of it saying, follow me, here I am, here I am, here I am. So uh, this is one of the cool things of how deer are communicating, even without making a sound, you know, without any smell or anything else, simply by how their eyes are designed and how the hair patterns on their bodies are. Well, there's other ways deer communicate with sight as well. We can look at this deer here, and you know immediately, is this guy in a good mood or a bad mood? And we know immediately based on his posture, based on his ears laid back, this guy is in a bad mood. You know, this is bad intentions written all after off that big extended uh, uh, right brow I bet you from a fighting standpoint he can inflict some damage on somebody else who has a normal set of antlers because he's not lining up evenly with that right side but deer communicate with all kinds of sight with the way that their ear position is think about it ears forward alert ears back upset or mad they also communicate simply with their hair Deer that are particularly bucks as they get ready to fight, they can stand all that hair up, makes themselves look bigger. So they communicate easily, they communicate through eye contact, <laughs> or in many cases, lack of eye contact. You have two bucks that are about to fight. If one is much bigger, if one does not want to fight, maybe he's smaller. One of the things that they do is, you know, they will look away. They absolutely will not make eye contact with that larger deer. This is direct lines of communication. It's a way for them to say, hey, I don't want anything to do with you. I know you're bigger, you're badder. I want nothing to do with this, I, I don't like. So there's lots of things going on visually that deer can communicate with that way. We could talk this whole webinar just about communication with sight, but let's end the sight part there, give you the kind of big picture view and come to another way, which is touch. Deer have nerves. That's how they know what's going on with their antlers during the growing phase but they are very social and they do a lot of mutual grooming. Now it's not just picking bugs off each other like we see with monkeys or some other animals. They are 
bonding with each other. They are communicating with each other. They are making sure that they recognize who this other animal is and as well as putting their own sign on. So you see lots of grooming with does and with fawns, but we see a lot of this as well with bucks. And this is especially true during the pre-rut when bucks are really developing that pecking order. And uh, what's going on here, the smaller buck, he's smelling this bigger buck. And if you ever watch two deer that, that kind of do a little bit of the sparring and start pushing each other a little bit, the, the buck who is the subdominant one, or the subordinate one, I'm sorry, the subordinate one, um, he will often lick the forehead gland of the dominant buck. And essentially, he is making sure that he understands who that buck is by identity, by smell, but he's also letting him know, hey, I understand you're bigger than me. I understand you're better than me. You know, if we, when push comes to shove and the breeding season starts and I smell you or you see me or smell me, we're both very much in clue with, hey, you're on charge, you're on top. So all kinds of ways that deer communicate through touch as well. They obviously communicate through sound too. And there's lots of different ways through sound. Now, the interesting thing here is with uh, their ears, they actually hear very, very similarly to the way humans do. They can hear almost the exact same wavelengths and same sound waves that we can. The one thing is though, they have those big ears that they can funnel to, to really funnel the sound into them. And they are obviously really, really good at picking up sounds that are uh, out of the ordinary or are not supposed to be there when they're outside. So think about it like this, you're driving your truck, man, that makes the tiniest little bit of sound that doesn't sound quite right you pick up on it immediately. Your wife or girlfriend may not pick up on it at all. Your buddies may not pick up on it, but you know. Same thing with deer when they're in the woods. You know, they hear uh, that arrow ting off the tree stand. They hear the climbing sticks clang. They hear something that's a little different. They know immediately. But sound-wise, they hear very similar to us. They just do a really good job paying attention to that sound. But some of the different sounds that deer make, anybody that's hunted deer very long has obviously heard the blow, you know, that where they clearly are identifying with something that, hey, I see something there or I smell something that's not quite right. They often then are trying to get a better whiff of whatever that is. But through that blow, then they also are notifying the other deer around like, hey, oh, heads up here, something is over here. So they're communicating danger or at least concern over here. They want other deer to pay attention to what's going on. Whoa, that's not good, hold on. My apologies there, Matt. My computer uh, jumped ahead on me. They also communicate with the stomp. And this is where they will drive that front foot into the ground. This is often when they have seen something and they think, ooh, maybe I saw movement there. I'm not exactly sure that something was up, but something doesn't look just right. They will stomp in an effort to get whatever it is to move or to show itself. So in addition to what's happening with that, then also other deer around like, ooh, they can hear that, they know what's going on. So it's a way that they can alert others to, hey, let's heads up again. I think something might be over here. They also communicate uh, with a lot of sounds to each other that they are vocal. Um, when a doe sends her fawns off to, to, to bed, she doesn't know exactly where they're going. She sends them off into this uh, general area. She will then go back three to four times during the day and call them to have them come to her so that she can nurse them. And this is a, a soft mew, it's very soft, you know, like a meow, meow, meow. You have to be very close to be able to hear this, but that's the way that her fawns are like, oop, that's mama, stand up, go to her and know, oop, it's time to eat. Well, the most common of all the sounds that we hear to communicate with are the grunts. And we know there's a whole variety or a whole series of different grunts that bucks will make. You know, this is a meh. Meh, meh. We have lots of calls that you can use these with, simulate them. This is obviously the perfect time of the year to, to, to be able to use these. So vocalization, bucks will do to communicate both with other bucks as well as does. And uh, they will do this uh, any time of the year, but more so than any other point though. But uh, lots of communication going on this way. Well, the most aggressive call that deer will make is the, the grunt snort wheeze. And uh, now that we have more older bucks on the landscape than we have in at least the last 100 years, this is an extremely aggressive call when a, a buck, and usually a mature buck, is really, really agitated and is mad at something. 
Um, lots of calls that can do this. I've heard people try to do this and just absolutely uh, terrible with it. But if you want to know what this really sounds like and how to do this, this is right from our website. This is our founder, Joe Hamilton. He can do this really, really well. And he does a great rendition of this on there. So if you want to know how you're supposed to make this call, even with your voice or with that call that you bought at the local sporting goods store, go to our website. This is the article, Grunt, Snort, Wheeze, how and when to use this. And you can hear Joe do this. There's lots of debate over whether it's actually, you know, if the, if the snort is an exhale or an inhale. And, uh, and actually hear what it is. It's the grunt, the snort, which is out, an exhale, and the wheeze is the inhale. So this is a, that's the sound. And uh, if you have the ability to, to hear a deer do this, it is an awesome day in the woods, whether you get to, to release that arrow or not. If you have the ability to call to a deer and call a mature buck in this way, that is absolutely one of the top puns that you'll have in your life. So uh, really, really cool call. Certainly something that you can scare a lot of deer with and particularly younger deer, if you don't use this appropriately, but uh Pretty cool thing to be able to use if uh, if you need one more trick to get that mature buck that's just out of range in with you. Well, deer also communicate with smell. And this is the really, really big one. And this is what we're gonna focus the vast majority of our talk on here. Uh, their eyes are not all that much better than ours. Their ears are about exactly the same as ours. Their nose though is way, way better than ours. And some people will look at this and think, yeah, the nose is that little black thing in his face there. And true, that is his nose, but that's just the end of his nose. A deer's nose actually goes from the end of that all the way up into the brain. And it has incredible surface area up through the, the face there to allow just uh, so much more uh, acceptance of all of the scent molecules and so an understanding, a differentiation of what is there and just a perception of what that is. A lot of people will say, you know, how many times better can a deer smell than a human? Is it a thousand? Is it a hundred thousand? And you can find all kinds of accounts in the in outdoor writing. Of, oh yes, it's this much better. The reality of it is we don't really know how much better. It's probably on the order of 50 to a hundred thousand times better, but we don't know that for sure and what we're able to do. But let's talk about some of the ways that we can then use that. Well, Six glands, well, does have six glands, bucks have seven. The two most important glands for deer, one is on the head, that is the forehead gland that you see here. Researchers from the University of Georgia have identified nearly 50 different pieces of information that deer can share about themselves through this forehead gland. And this is a true gland where it has an increase in glandular activity during the breeding season. And this is why on older bucks, you often see that hair on the forehead turn colors, this chestnut color or a reddish color. And oftentimes that hair gets real wavy. That's because of increased activity in that gland. The other gland that is so important to deer is the tarsal gland. And this is the one on the inside of the back leg. And this is the one that captures all of the scent. You know, it's the, how the deer carries the scent of them on it. And is so important to, uh, to the breeding season that we talk about at scrapes. But uh, I'm going to reference both of these two glands and how do you use them as rubs and scrapes, which, right, that's, that's the theme of what we're talking about tonight as we go through here. So rubs and scrapes. This is certainly something that we love to see start increasing as we lead from summer into early fall, something that we monitor as hunters, places we hang cameras, places we hunt over, two of the coolest things that are going on in the woods. And even if you're not seeing deer, just seeing this amount of activity is pretty cool. We can see deer tracks. That's fun. We can see deer scat, that's fun. But when you start seeing rubs and you start seeing scrapes, that's a whole different level of feeling. That makes the hair stand up on your neck a little bit and that gets you so much more excited than even the biggest deer trail that may look like a cow path. Rubs and scrapes are where it's at. So let's talk about rubs first. Rubbing peaks during the pre-rut and it maintains that level throughout the whole season. And in fact, bucks will rub anytime they have hard antlers. So it's not just during the rut. Anytime those antlers are hard, as soon as that velvet comes off, they will start rubbing and they can continue all the way until they shed them, you know, after uh, the new year. These may be very small little rubs like you're seeing here, or they may be much larger rubs. You know, and we used to think that, oh, they're just using those rubs, you know, to get that velvet off their antlers. 
And well, they do rub them to get some of that velvet off. That's not really what's going on here. Really what's going on is these are signposts. They are using these rugs to share information about themselves for other deer to collect. And dominant bucks, especially, they can express uh, superiority at these. You know, they're leaving information about themselves at these. And really large rubs are ones that are often used year after year. And I'm sure that many of you have seen very big rubs or certain trees that truly are rubbed year after year after year. Now, think about this. I just talked about that forehead gland. What's going on at these rubs is one, buck will rub a tree. They will use their antlers to break that cambium layer. They're shredding the bark. What that does is that provides a visual cue of something that's going on here. Ooh, deer can travel through to see that. Hey, I better go check that out. It also releases some aromatics from that tree to alert, to alert deer that, ooh, something's over here. There must be a new bulletin board. I need to go check it out. And this is why bucks really like to rub trees that are really aromatic. Think cedars, pines, and others. So uh, they obviously will rub a wide variety of trees, but they really, really like trees that are aromatic because it's another way to alert other deer to, hey, come over here and check this out. So they break that cambium layer, then they rub their forehead gland on this. They're not just rubbing their antlers, they're rubbing their forehead gland. Now remember, we just said those guys, the, the smart people from the University of Georgia are finding all this information that bucks can share about themselves. This is what they're leaving on this rub. And this is why other deer then want to come and check this out. They, they're not coming to see who makes the biggest rub. This is basically a buck leaving his uh, business card on the bulletin board. They're coming to check out and see what is there. So if that's the case, and we hear about people talking about rub lines where a buck has his rub line, you know, do they defend those lines? Absolutely not. There, there, there's no truth to that at all. Numerous bucks will rub on any one of these. They're leaving information there. So when a buck rubs it, he leaves his information. And if it's the biggest buck in the area, he doesn't want uh, all the other deer to stay away from it. He wants them to come there as well and leave information so he knows who's in the area. Because does also will come and check these. It's not just bucks. So all kinds of information sharing is going on at these rubs. Now, because they're both visual as well as scent posts, this is a, a, a power line pole here. I was working in South Central Kansas a number of years ago. How many overstory trees do you see here? There are none. This is a very open landscape. This is a tremendous place to hunt deer. You know, one of the better places in the country to hunt deer. I'm riding with a landowner. He runs lots of cameras. We saw this, this is a few hundred yards away. And uh, I said, uh, do, you, do you put a camera on that power line pole? And he said, no. I said, do you ever go look at that? Um, he said, well, not a lot. And I said, let's drive to that. And he said, why? And I said, I guarantee you, Every buck in this area comes to this and checks it out. And look at the base of this power line pole. It has been rubbed so much just from bucks rubbing on this over the years that they have wore it thin. I have seen the exact same thing on power line poles in Illinois, on fence posts in numerous different states. Any place that you have a real open landscape or a real agricultural landscape where you don't have a lot of overstory trees, deer use whatever else is available. If I own this property and I only had one camera, this is where it would be because I will guarantee you every deer in the area during the breeding season is coming through and checking this power line pull out to collect information on who's in the area, who has been here, and then to leave their calling card as well. This is also the time during the pre-route when bucks are developing that pecking order. They don't want to fight. They might get hurt. They might die. And at the very least, they don't get hurt, but if they don't win, they've wasted a lot of energy fighting. So bucks have a very well-defined pecking order that they have as they get into the, to the rut, just like dogs or chickens or any other animal like this. So they push each other around, they spar a little bit, they smell each other, they lick the forehead gland, this, all that. So this whole rubbing thing then helps them from this pecking order because if they know the identity and the scent of another deer, then they can visit these rubs and know, ooh, that's Matt. I either know if I'm above Matt or below Matt on that pecking order, and then that lets them know who's in the area and kind of where they fit into the whole order scheme. Now, doesn't mean that bucks aren't going to fight. We see bucks fighting all the time. But you know what? Most fights that we see are between individuals that are about the same size, or about the same age, but that have not had that chance to, to, to meet each other or develop that pecking order prior to the breeding season. You know, it's a buck that's on an excursion or one that's greatly expanded his home range, 
So uh, that's where most of the fighting comes from. Bucks don't want to have to do that. But uh, fortunately for us, it does happen. And it's one of the coolest things we get to see. All right, let's shift gears in and talk about scrapes. Scraping is also a signpost behavior. And this is the timing though, this peak is a little bit different from the rubs. It typically peaks just before we see peak breeding. So, and then this actually falls off some as we get into the rub. But the cool thing here is it involves a sequence of, of events and specific behaviors here that we see. The first is that the buck will mark an overhanging branch. This is what we call the licking branch. They will lick it, they rub it, and in many cases, they are rubbing that preorbital gland, which is that gland right in front of their eye on it. They're rubbing their forehead gland on it. And if you've ever watched a buck work a licking branch, it's not just a quick lick and done. It's a very serious uh, scene that they'll go through. They will smell it, they'll lick it, they'll rub their, their gland, one or the other, or both glands on it. They'll smell it some more, they'll lick it again, they'll mouth it. They are getting the exact right scent on that that they want. This guy here, he's not stargazing. What's he doing? That's a licking branch right above him. He's collecting information from that to say, hey, who has been here in the past? He is standing in the scrape looking at the licking branch. And if you look just above those oak leaves right above his nose, you can see where that branch has been broken. So the buck that, that made that licking branch was up on his hind feet, broke that branch off, and it's hanging down. This is where they are leaving that information. So that licking branch, extremely important. So they get their exact scent that they want on it. They're collecting information from who else has been there too, but they'll leave their own. And you can see this guy here is really staring. He may be who was there. He may have just mouthed this and he's smelling himself. You don't know for sure, but he clearly is collecting information from the licking branch. We haven't even got to the scrape on the ground underneath the chair, the exposed dirt. This is all going on above ground at these uh, on the branch. And this branch, if you remove that, in almost every case, you can stop all activity at that scrape. It can be the hottest scrape in the county. And if they don't have that licking branch above it to, to, uh, to initiate all of the other behaviors, in almost every case, they will stop using that scrape. So they get that licking branch just right. Next, the buck hallway below that, creating a little shallow depression. So this is another visual cue, exposed dirt, and then they often will go ahead and urinate in that. They might urinate straight in it, or they might rub urinate like this guy is doing. He has pulled his back legs together. He is going to urinate into the scrape, and he will rub those tarsal glands together while the urine is dripping down over. Some of the urine ends up in the scrape. A lot of the urine ends up on his tarsal glands, which then they are just specialized hairs that will capture that urine the bacteria will interact with it. And this is what allows that deer to carry the scent of himself. This is his brute or his old spice that they carry around with them. So pretty, pretty neat uh, concept of how they can carry that to be able to advertise themselves and communicate with others. Now, with that scrape that we've seen underneath there too, even if they don't urinate in it, you can create a mock scrape. If you're in an area where there is not exposed dirt, think you know, you're in a, a hardwood forest or you're in a pine forest or you're in an old field, Wherever it is, if you just create an open space that has dirt, exposed dirt, and put a camera on it, deer will come to it. They almost cannot walk by an area of exposed dirt if it's in an area, you know, if that's separate from all the other stuff. So if you're in a wide open ag field and it's all exposed dirt, that's not what I'm talking about. But an area that does not have a lot of open dirt, where you open some, deer will go to that. It's a visual thing that they want to be at anyway. Then, of course, these deer are urinating in it, which creates the scent part of it which draws them in. And then you have the visual of uh, the living of the licking branch and all the smell on that as well. So there's a lot of things going on here, a very complex system for deer to be able to share this information. Now, we know that field edges are great places for scrapes. This guy, this little buck here you see is smelling what's going on above him. He even has his eyes closed, like he is just in, in heaven with what's going on here. Uh, he's standing in a scrape right here at the edge of this field. However, they don't have to be in fields. We see these all the times in woods as well, but you can take a look. We have more open woods in the foreground, much thicker woods in the, in the background here. Essentially, any place that two cover types come together, you have an increased chance of seeing scrapes. And if you want to make mock scrapes to either hang a camera on to draw deer to or to start a scrape like that where deer will come in and visit, 
any place that you have two different cover types coming together is an ideal place. You can absolutely make deer come right to that with it. Now, they will scrape other places as well, but anytime we can get a couple different uh, uh, cover types together, definitely good places for this. And, uh, and I'm sure that you have seen this wherever you may, may hunt. However, there's a lot of times that deer are collecting information from these scrapes where it's the info is received, but it's not necessarily shared. There's a scrape in the foreground here. This buck skirted this the whole way, stopped, was smelling what's going on, and kept going. If you haven't had a bunch of rain that washes some of the scent away, in many cases that scent, once they urinate in, it can stay there for a number of days. So they don't necessarily need to be right on top of the scrape to collect all the information. You know, you don't need to be two feet away from a bulletin board. You know, if you have decent vision, you can be standing back a little bit. If somebody has a pretty good sized business card, you can read what's going on there. Exact same thing with deer. So a lot of cases, they're coming in downwind. We'll see what has been there and then keep going. If they come in many times, you know, if they particularly, if they can smell their own scent there or they know that they don't need to advertise again and keep on checking and traveling along. So uh, pretty interesting that uh, they're always collecting, not always leaving information at these though. Well, we've talked a bunch about bucks here. Is it just bucks that do this? Is it just bucks leaving information at scrapes? And the answer is no, not at all. Does are visiting these things like crazy as well. This doe is checking this licking branch to say, hey, who has been here? And they not only collect information, they leave information too. It's very common for does to be urinating in scrapes, for does to rub their genitals on rubs. They want the bucks to know who, you know, who is there as well. They're advertising all the time, just like bucks are. So uh, this is not just a buck thing. This is both sexes on a very regular basis, leaving information at these. This is an article that I wrote uh, a number of years ago for Quality Whitetails. And uh, this is pretty cool. This was all about a, a scrape. And this was a single scrape. I'm a huge camera fan. I had a camera on this scrape, and we had actually gone through a pretty quiet archery season. And now this particular scrape is about 150 yards from my camp across an old field. So uh, wild, you could see the scrape from our camp. because the, the, the elevation climb to get to the woods is high enough that even though that old field has three or four feet of vegetation in it, you can see the woods above that. And this scrape was just inside the woods. Um, check this camera. Uh, once we got deep into November and uh, realized, even though we had not been seeing much during this particular buck season or this particular archery season, I'm sorry, this one scrape got really hot. And what we saw over the course of 13 days at the scrape, I had 88 pictures of 20 different bucks. Way more than, than 20 buck pictures, but 20 different bucks over the course of 13 days hit the scrape. So just like rubs, where a buck doesn't defend a rub line, uh, same with scrapes. Numerous bucks come into these scrapes and, and will leave information collect information, share information with what's going on. They won't hit every single one of them. And sometimes you can have scrapes in pretty close proximity to each other. If you're monitoring both or maybe more of them with cameras, you'll see certain bucks may, may hit all of them. Other bucks will only visit one or two of them. So uh, remember, each buck has its own personality and how they want to travel and what they want to share. But uh, there's lots and lots of animals visiting all of these scrapes, as well as all of these rubs and leaving information on a very regular basis. Well, if I just told you 20 different bucks hit that scrape in a 13 day period, are these places that we want to hunt? Well, maybe, and sometimes. And what I mean by that is there are certain cases that yeah, you can see bucks coming in and hitting these scrapes, but research shows that the vast majority of scrape use occurs at night, about 84% of it's at night. But that still means 16% of it occurs during daylight or during shooting hours. So if you like to hunt over scrapes, then I'm not telling you don't. But uh, the odds are that buck is going to visit it at day or at night rather than during daylight. However, though, we still can use that information to help us because if we know where that buck wants to be bedding, and we know that he's often going to hit that scrape shortly after dark, we can set ourselves up such as to intercept him on the way where he may not make it to the scrape till after dark, but he might be on his feet moving through some cover before that. And if we know where he wants to bed and where he wants to go, that's a great opportunity for us to set up in between and uh, have an opportunity to pose with that guy uh, with our bow or our rifle in our hand. Well, let's summarize this all then by saying 
we should call it the super highway because there is information being shared all the time, every day, every day throughout the year. And they do this partly just to stay in contact with the locals that are out there, as well as all those travelers. You know, we know that deer expand the home range, both bucks and does during the fall. So deer want to see who's in the area, who's coming through, what's going on. This is a way that they're able to do that. So with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, some of this information. I'm guessing you knew some of this. I hope I at least shared something that's going to help you get a little closer to some of those deer this fall. Uh, this is my uh, email address here. We'll go through a Q&A now, and I'm glad to answer any questions that we possibly can. But uh, when we're done here, um, feel free. You can email me at this at any point. I am glad to help out. I love to talk to people about deer or habitat or what I can do to, to help you get a little closer in the fall. So uh, with that, Matt, I'll stop sharing my screen here. I'll kick it back over to you. And uh, hopefully we have a few questions here that uh, the folks are sending in that uh, we can have some fun with. Sure. Excellent job. So if you do have a question, type it in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, and I'm actually going to start with um, a question that was sent in earlier today via email, which you can do in future, uh, future webinars. If it's something that you see a topic coming up, uh, which we'll announce what next month is here in a minute. Uh, if you see that and you can send us a, a question, we'll address it that evening if we can. So uh, a question we got earlier today, Kip, was about um, basically inadvertently creating what the, what the emailer said, a doe and fawn, fawn mecca. Um, not getting a lot of pictures of bucks. Uh, he does harvest a nice buck every once in a while, but countless does and fawns on camera. Um, how do you how do you prevent that from happening? Not directly related to communication, but um, can you address that question? Sure. You know, and actually, I got that question a few times this year as we were getting into kind of the pre rut People say, "Man, I've been I've been improving some habitat. And I got does and fawns everywhere, but no bucks." You know, should I be doing something to not encourage does and fawns to be here now? And I said, absolutely not. You, you, anytime you can enhance habitat and encourage deer to be there, that is a benefit for you. And uh, if there's a bunch of does and fawns there now, nothing at all wrong with that because bucks are going to be there during the run. Those does are going to be leaving information, you know, about themselves. They will be advertising. So, uh, yeah, nothing wrong with, you know, if you're seeing a bunch of fawns and does, if you're not a bunch of bucks, hold tight, take a weekend in the breeding season. The boys are going to be there, so uh, always good to enhance habitat for deer. Awesome! All right, uh, not a question, but uh, Vince says loves this, love the sound effects, and I think uh, I, the audience agree. All the different calls and grunts and sounds you made, Kip, it sounds like a whole uh, circus going on over there. But that that was good. Um, Chris asks if you have numerous bucks on cam, but very few rub scrapes. Uh, does that indicate the rut is not close, or it's not their home range? Let me repeat that. Um, if you have numerous bucks on camera, is, but no. very few rubs and scrapes, does it indicate the rut is not close or it's not their home range? It, it would more likely mean that, you know what, they're just not getting real close to the rut yet. It's the, the research on scrapes especially are very, very clear. You almost can time when the peak rut is happening in your area based on scrape use. And, uh, and it's often one to two weeks before peak breeding when you see the peak and scrape use. So if you're monitoring scrapes, you often can see the activity at them build and build and build and build. And then you're like, this is great. This is great. I see deer moving. And just about the time that that really slows down is when the majority of the move or the peak movement is passed. And now peak conception is going to be happening. So uh, for him, I'd say it's probably just that, you know, he still was just a little bit out from, uh, from peak breeding. Perfect. We got a two part question from Cole. Uh, the first part is if a buck checks a scrape and senses a doe has been there uh, after his last visit, will he visit again or more often in hopes to run into that doe? And then the second part is if a doe does urinate in the scrape, does that mean she's ready to breed? Great question. Uh, we'll do the second part first. Uh, yeah, very, very good question. The second part first is no, that does not mean she's ready to breed. When does are, and some people think that that's how does advertise it by, by urinating like that. That's not true um, because she's leaving that urine and then leaving. You know, she's going somewhere, depositing it, and then leaving that area. So she will leave that urine, deposit urine for bucks to come in and check, you know, to be able to, okay, know who is there, stay with them. That, but bucks actually tell when a doe is ready to breed by the vaginal secretions. She carries the scent of estrus with her. So the urine keeps them in, in the game, 
lets them know what's going on and then follow her around. But uh, she lets them know she's ready to breed by standing. When a doe stands and does not run away from a buck, that is the cue that she's ready. Until she's ready, she will continue to, to, to move off. All right. Let's do a uh, rapid fire here. We're getting lots of questions, so let's try to get to as many as we possibly can. Is that um, well-used scrape from 2013 a community scrape, the one that you wrote the article about? Is it still used as a community scrape today? Um, that was that was a huge. It is not, and actually, it wasn't the next year either. That was that was a one-year thing. There's lots of scrapes in and around that, but uh, but that is more so exactly where they will scrape is more dictated by what cover is there than exactly that spot. So uh, that was the hottest scrape on our whole farm that year. Um, wasn't even a scrape under that tree the next year. Good, good, good question. Stick with us, folks. I'm going to give away that prize here in a few minutes. We'll end around uh, the top of the hour. Do does initiate scrapes or do they just visit the ones created by bucks? Good question. I've never seen a doe. Yeah, that's great. I've never seen a doe initiate one, and I've never seen in the research where they have. I have lots of pictures of where they visit them. So uh, I'm not saying they won't initiate one, but I don't. I believe that if they do, it'd be very uncommon. I would say bucks probably initiate 99 or maybe 100% of all the scrapes, then does just visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, George asked, uh, says uh, 84 uh, percent of bucks visit scrapes at nights. What a, with scrapes at night? What about uh, rubs and the time of day that they're made? Is there any research on that? There is, and, uh, and there's definitely more uh, visitation of rubs during the day. However, um, scrapes seem to be a better place in many cases to really uh, draw in a bunch of animals, partly just because you end up with way more rubs on a property, um, particularly if you have older deer then you do scrapes. So scrapes act more at, or as better funnels or pinch points than rubs. So uh, they will rub more during the day than they tend to scrape during the day. Um, but uh, there's not nearly as much out there about hunting over rubs just because bucks make so many rubs that there's not really a bunch of an advantage in most cases to sitting over those. There's a question here, Kip. Do calls and scents get overused over over time, and deer get wise to hunters using them? So basically, overuse of uh, of calls and scents. What's your thoughts there? I think they absolutely can, and it, it's less about. Yeah, I think they absolutely can, particularly from the scent side. But it's less about the actual scent and more about the person trout or being there and carrying his or her scent with them there every time. You know, to either to put that scent out. From the call standpoint, um, yep, they absolutely can. But remember, particularly during the rut, when bucks are moving a lot, you know, it's it's easier to overcall pre-rut when deer are not moving as much. We get into the rut, I'm totally fine with, with grunting literally every five to 10 minutes, rattling every 10 minutes, particularly when I know bucks are on their feet moving because they're coming in and out of hearing range on a pretty regular basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, so can you overcall? You certainly can. But, uh, but it's more difficult to, to overcall once you get into the rut. There's a question here about deer urine versus human urine. Are there big differences? Um, only that one comes from a deer and one comes from a human. Um, there's some cool research out of Penn State showing that human urine attracted just as many bucks to the scrape as doe and heat urine. So, uh, and actually new car smell in a scrape attracted just as many bucks as doe and heat urine. So it's less about the actual urine itself as it is I see the visual scrape. There's a scent in it. I'm going to go check it out. There's your sign, right? Uh, what are some strategies to use a lure with scrapes? Any strategies in terms of scrape lure? So I'm a huge fan of, of, of monitoring deer over scrapes with cameras. I, I love to start mock scrapes. I start almost every one of them with, uh, with my own urine. So uh, um, you can use that. You can use other deer urine as well. Um, if you do, there's certainly value out there today with, with using urine that, that, that has been certified, you know, from a place that doesn't have CWD or using synthetic urine. We certainly don't want to be spreading disease. The, the, the likelihood of spreading it with urine is extremely, extremely low. But still, you know, if you have an opportunity to, to use something different, that's, that's always a good thing. But uh, nothing wrong with using your own urine in it as well. Hey, you just kind of answered another question. What substances are best to use to make scrapes? Um, so it hit that one. Um, when creating a mock scrape, how effective is it to hang a drip bag? Um, and does it entice bucks to visit during the day as advertised? 
Uh, drip bags can can be very uh, very advantageous because it continues to deposit you know more more stuff in it, which acts like something has been there freshening it up. Um, but I don't think that it encourages bucks to spend the more daytime movement there. You know, they don't know that yeah. it's you know a mock scrape and something else is putting it there. Research is very clear that most scrape visits are at night. So uh, that mock scrape, the dripper, I think does have the advantage of you don't have to go back and put new stuff in it. Um, but I don't think it's encouraging deer to spend more daytime activity there. Yeah, I don't think there's been research on that, but my gut tells me that that's true. And uh, research does show that bucks will revisit doe groups to check receptiveness every 20 to 36 hours. Um, I don't know if that's been shown to done being done during daylight or at night, but it just, they are just continually checking back. Um, there's a question here. We got five more minutes and we got a bunch of questions. So we'll answer a couple more. Um, when we check scrapes rubs, are we contaminating the area? What do you think about that? Absolutely can be. Yeah, absolutely can be. And that's when I said about, uh, taking the scent in, you know, can you, over you sent yes and that's by carrying your scent in while you're trying to deposit the, the deer urine or whatever so uh you absolutely can can contaminate the area by taking your your own scent in so uh, be very careful about that here's a good question kip um from ryan is there a direct correlation between the pheromones released by the preorbital gland and the deer's urge to lick and chew on the branches above the scrape that's an awesome question um reese i don't we don't know the yeah. answer to that specifically from the preorbital gland, but definite evidence of those pheromones from the forehead gland. So uh, clearly forehead, but uh, they, I don't think so from the preorbital and researchers don't believe that there is, but that absolutely is the case from the forehead gland. Great question. He followed up with, it said intake from the vomeronasal organ would make the most sense if so, but that wouldn't pertain to a specific gland, but it's just the intake of the pheromones, not necessarily one gland over the other. Um, and if you want to describe what that what that organ is. Yeah, yeah, that vomeronasal nasal organ is that, that diamond shaped organ in the roof of their mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when they're doing the flaming of that lip curl. Some people incorrectly think that that's how they tell if a doe is in heat. What they're doing is they are lip curling, which exposes that organ, that allows them to take in either urine or the scent molecules off urine, and that pumps it then to a part of the brain that actually doesn't even control behavior. So there's no way that could tell, enable them to tell if the doe is in heat. But essentially, when those does are urinating and moving around, that allows that buck to visit that urine, pump that through that vomeral nasal organ to the brain. It's essentially a part of the brain that keeps that buck in breeding condition. So it's kind of like that buck taking a daily Viagra. It's not letting him know that doe is in heat, but it makes sure that it keeps his body ready so that when she does stand and is in heat, he is then able to breed her. We got three left, and I think we're going to heat, hit each one. I think they're going to be quickies. Does the size of the scrape reflect the size or age of the buck that made it? Yes or no? Not at all. No, it doesn't at all. And I've seen small scrapes made by huge bucks, and I have seen absolutely, you know, half Volkswagen sized scrapes, you know, the small bucks started and then numerous other bucks kind of came in. So, uh, so no, size does not indicate size of the deer. Uh, is there always a dominant doe that basically warns the other deer around? You know, is that true? Is there always like one individual that is the, the, the one that makes that, those, those signs and those sounds? In different, in different deer groups, there, there certainly is. Any deer can give those warning sounds, but, but all groups of deer um, often will have a matriarch, you know, a doe, and it's often groups of, you know, her offspring and aunts and cousins and all those together. So it's not one deer on an entire property, but in any given group that you have a multiple deer, one definitely is a matriarch, but any deer there can, can signal danger to the whole group. I was going to ask you a question about uh, um, the truth about rub lines or scrape lines if we didn't get many questions, but there's a lot of questions and I'm going to ask one last one. It's not mine. I think it's a good one to end on. Uh, how would you rate the rut intensity this year and what stage do you feel it is in PA? What do you think about that? I will say this. Uh, my kids and I have witnessed some incredible reading or writing behavior already through our, our archery season. Um, I do know some guys on, on our farm that, that have seen very little. It would answer much differently, uh, but we have seen a tremendous amount of chasing, both young bucks just cruising. We have seen three and four-year-old bucks with does 
chasing them. Um, so we're not at the, the peak of it yet or the peak of movement yet, um, but, uh, but we have had an outstanding archery season so far with, with some of the breeding activity that we've got to witness. And this is North Central Pennsylvania, right up on the New York border. Awesome job, Kip. All right, folks, let's give away that prize. But first, um, if you're not already a member, join the National Deer Association, right? We need members, we need your support, and uh, we'd love to have you as part of our family um, to do good for deer in all different ways. Um, if you're interested in supporting us in different ways, Nick mentioned some things at the beginning you could get involved in. Um, right now we have a, um, a sweepstakes for some mission crossbows. You can give to the, to the NDA fund. Um, you could attend a, an event, whether it's a fundraiser or just come and learn at, at a, an event. Um, just support us in many, many different ways. We'd love to have you as part of it. Kip, what's coming up next month? Yeah, we got a cool one next month. This is Dr. Gino D'Angelo from the University of Georgia. Very good member of our, good friend of ours. Te he's teach or taught in a lot of the uh, deer steward class we've had. He probably has the coolest title of any talk of the whole year of webinars. It's uh, Drugs and Tasers, Research to Train the Next Class of Deer Managers. So, uh, you know, talk about darting deer and tasing deer and all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, um, you know, he's a professor at the University of Georgia, teaches students, has graduate students. We're in for a treat next month, Matt. We are. We are. I can't wait. Um, all right. Prize giveaway. So in the chat feature, not the Q&A where people were just typing in the questions and we were responding. In the chat feature, I want you to type in the answer to this question. I'm going to give a, a softball up to see if we can knock it out of the park. So Kip mentioned a bunch of different facts and figures. I always try to do something that's very specific metric because it's easy and it's, it's not subjective. Um, so the first person to answer this question correctly um, will we'll get your email address and we will send you this hat, the National Deer Association uh, First Light hat, trucker hat in, in the Spectre camo pattern. And uh, so the question is, how many glands does a white-tailed deer doe have whoa they shot up there's a lot of sevens <laughs> there in the beginning but the answer is six and peter ray answered that correctly six bucks have an extra gland that those don't have so six mm -hmm. peter ray we'll get your contact information you can email me at matt at deer association.com or we'll just pull it from the uh, from the registration list and we'll get you this hat, but we appreciate it. Hope everybody enjoyed the webinar. Great information, Kip. Uh, come back next month. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, man. Good deal. Good, and good